I think we better make a start because there are 25 people online already. So for the sake of uh, punctuality, I think we uh, can start now. <laughs> Very few in the room. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Daniel Mordiarso um, with C4 Recraft, and it's been running project uh, on sustainable wetland adaptation and mitigation program supported by uh, USID and working with colleagues in the uh, US Forest Service for more than a decade. And uh, we've been working a lot on issues related to um, carbon uh, breadth and wealth in the uh, coastal uh, ecosystem, especially mangrove. And looking at that for many years, um, in many countries, we thought it's time now to look at the other issue, which is, you know, waiting for us with regard to market. So uh, this community is going to share with us and also with you in the audience uh, online about our thinking and our ideas about the future of blue carbon in the context of market. And from the scientific point of view, we are happy to have a crowd of experts in their own uh, field and, and uh, interests uh, to help us understanding where we are going to move forward uh, after you know, this conversation. And uh, the title of this uh, session is called Improving the Confidence. So the, the key words there is confidence. And as I said, we have numbers, but most of the time people are questioning. So that uh, it's a challenge for us, especially the scientific community to improve the quality of, of the data. And um, another topic that we are looking forward to see and perhaps also expect the challenges is regarding the governance. So that that will be a new uh, area for blue carbon community. So I'm happy to uh, introduce our uh, speakers today. Uh, we have um, Indonesian colleagues uh, who's been working for mangrove restoration and peatland for many years. And uh, he is willing to share with us uh, about the work in Indonesia, uh, whether it's going to be restoration or rehabilitation or, and as well as conservation, uh, we will see what uh, does it mean in the context of carbon and market. Um, Mr. Noviar will be with us online. And then um, the work in Indonesia has been followed by many colleagues, uh, including colleagues in FAO. Uh, Pablo will be looking at that from the perspective of remote sensing and finer fine-tuning the, the site for restoration and the quality of carbon there. And then uh, we will also have uh, colleagues who is looking at the market and the issue of finance. Um, 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 Melissa uh, is also online from Germany, looking at the finance system um, from other projects, and she will share with us what's going to happen if this finance uh, stream is going to be implemented in the blue carbon arena. Team calls uh, just arrived before lunch, <laughs> rushing to the room here, luckily from the UK, and uh, will be sharing with us his idea of uh, having a better market and quality of, of the uh, asset in the blue carbon ecosystem by incorporating the importance of protecting biodiversity. So talking about premium price uh, biodiversity is really uh, on the uh, uh, spotlight of buyers and also global community. So we look forward to hear what uh, Tim Coles is going to share with us and guide us uh, where to go in the future in you know, improving the quality and, and also incorporating biodiversity. Tui, my colleagues uh, from C4 Recraft, has been working for a long time in GCS RED, Global Comparative Study on RED, and especially looking at the governance issue, benefit sharing, etc. Et so she will be jumping in the discussion and share with us where to go from you know, the challenges that they've been found in finding in the uh, 
great uh, community. But before my colleagues is going to um, give ideas and um, thought about their work uh, particularly, I would like to invite and welcome uh, Janet Nakoni from USID, who's been faithfully supporting our work uh, in Indonesia and elsewhere. We've been working, I mentioned in the plenary, about 20 plus countries so far in the last decades or so. Janet. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. My name is Janet Nakoni, and I'm with the um, US Agency for International Development, USCID. And my colleague, Evan Notman, is also here in the audience. And um, as Daniel mentioned, we've been supporting the Sustainable Wetlands Adaptation Mitigation Program, SWAMP, for uh, probably since about 2011. This is a consortium of uh, partnership between USAID, US Forest Service, and the Center for International Forestry Research, C4. And um, SWAMP really you know, builds capacity um, and conducts applied research to advance the conservation, management, and restoration of mangroves and tropical peatlands around the world. The scientists and researchers uh, in SWAMP work closely with uh, partner country governments to advance uh, mangrove and peatland restoration, carbon stocks and emissions estimations, and also data and mapping approaches. And SWAMP also provides support to help countries include mangroves and peatlands in their nationally determined contributions and advance their um, re reporting of their associated greenhouse gas emissions. And so uh, before I turn it back over to Daniel, I'd just like to highlight two real successes and contributions of the SWAMP program in the area of mangrove um, research and development. So. Uh, you might have heard, some of you who have worked in the mangroves have, might have heard about the SWAMP protocol. And this is a data collection method um, that's been used. It's used actively in 27 countries now to measure, monitor, and report on carbon uh, stocks in mangroves. And what's really special about it was that it was codified in the 2013 wetland supplement to the IPCC guidance. So it's really starting to be used a lot more um, often and really helps with these efforts. Another real success of SWAMP has been um, advancing methods for identifying priority sites for restoration in Indonesia. And I, I understand we'll hear a little bit uh, more about that today. So it's been really inspiring to see the results coming out of this program, really pairing up applied research uh, with country government decision making um, to really make more impact in, in the area of blue carbon. And this is really one of our programs that sort of comes the closest to sort of advancing pathways toward blue carbon and helping countries get ready to um, participate in those markets. So thanks so much to Daniel and to all the presenters uh, today. I really look forward to the session. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. That's very inspiring kind of direction where to go. And uh, thanks also for taking the note about uh, the progress so far. And uh, we are really encouraged to, to move forward. And um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we've been uh, lucky to have uh, a number of data and, and also um, information related to data because it's not only packets as the data, but also information. Uh, what uh, does it mean in terms of protecting or conserving and also restoring? But uh, this data uh, really need to be presented in the marketplace, if you wish, uh, because the, the wealth of the data is not to be kept in the uh, bookshelf or publication or whatever, but uh, really the public needs this. And we were, we've been very careful, and I'm, I'm trying to, to set the, the scene here uh, with countries where we've been working with and how to present this to them. That's that's very important uh, lesson that we learn when we present data. So market is, is going to be the next kind of level where people will be chatting and exchanging knowledge and experience. 
And um, with the data we have, we've been very privileged to have that kind of network. So globally, we've been covering this. My colleagues, Boone Kaufman, who been pioneering on this work, including the protocol that uh, Janet mentioned, uh, we put together the work across the globe. And what I would like to uh, underline here, like what I did in the plenary is that most of this stock is in the soil. So how, how important and how interesting it is for the market because usually people are looking at forests and carbon from the sky or from you know the surface but not under the ground so this this is the the issue that we have so when we are talking about peatland and mangrove in in the plenary mangrove always have low carbon content but high bulk density uh, compared with the peatland which is the other way around high uh, carbon content uh, low bulk density and uh, this stripes of vegetation protecting the coastal zone has important role in, in, in uh, adaptation uh, issues. So remember those uh, numbers about 1,000 or 1,500 ton per hectare, which is five times higher than terrestrial forests. But it is often misunderstood that mangrove sequestering five times compared with terrestrial ecosystem, which is completely wrong. The stock and the flux is different issues. So uh, we will see how market will see numbers like this, and hopefully they are not going to be misled by this multiplication of things. So um, another work that we did is looking at uh, in general, comparing the blue carbon, other blue carbon ecosystem, still mangrove is higher up there in, in the stage because the uh, net present value for the um, carbon and other ecosystem surfaces, this is something that we need to take care of also, is much, much higher than any other uh, wetland ecosystem or blue carbon ecosystem and the rest of uh, terrestrial forests. 90,000 uh, per hectare, that's the net present value, which is way beyond what people can get if you, for example, convert the ecosystem into oil palm plantation, which is only 9 to maximum 10,000, and this is 90,000. But, you know, the challenge is there with regard to destruction of this. So that's why somebody in the plenary mentioned that although we have this in a suit of uh, carbon rich ecosystem, the, the challenge is so high. And uh, I repeat this uh, again uh, from the plenary, just to make sure that uh, countries also have the agenda of including uh, blue carbon ecosystem in the adaptation, not only in the mitigation. And that is entertained in the NDC reporting. And next year, Sorry, this year will be the uh, stock taking will be presented in COP28 uh, from each country, the, the stock taking from the NDC. So blue carbon is in the middle of the conversation uh, today, but also in the context of other convention, including uh, climate change, certainly, but also biodiversity convention. And I was in uh, Glan uh, last week with the Ramsar Convention. Blue carbon is high in the agenda now. So uh, thanks to GFOI, also it's, it's also in the radar screen of this community. So suddenly we will be moving faster than I, I was thinking about. CMS is another. That's the Convention for Migratory Species. You know, very often we, we missed out these uh, issues that mangrove is the restaurant of this species to migrate from one place to the other. And then national agenda and other global agenda suddenly are looking at um, you know, achieving this target of sustainable uh, development goal. And there are a number of targets that has to be achieved um, in the rest of this decade. So uh, SDG 6, 13, 14 uh, will uh, have a lot of uh, bearing with blue carbon issues. The problem is, as we are going to speak today, um, how the finance uh, will be incorporated in this debate at national level, at local level, 
community involvement, and then uh, how it is going to be governed. So with uh, the speakers that I have, uh, I mentioned earlier, we are expecting them to uh, comment on, on this, you know, possibilities from their own perspective. Uh, we will begin with a case in Indonesia where 600,000 of mangrove will be restored in the next few years. Uh, the challenge is there. So we will be hearing from Pak Noviar, speaking from Jakarta online. Um, time is yours, Pak Noviar. Thank you, Pak Daniel. Does my voice sound clear? I want to know, does my voice sound clear, Pak Daniel? Yes, clear. Okay, thank Very you. clear. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Jakarta. First of all, I'm very grateful for invitation from GFOI to be a resource person at this event. In this session, I will present about the priorities in mangrove rehabilitation program in Indonesia. Okay. Based on the national mangrove map published by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in 2020, to the area of mangrove, mangrove ecosystem in Indonesia is 3.36 million hectares. This mangrove ecosystem is has a, a very large role on as an area for fish nursery, land protection from abrasion, carbon storage. Some literature, literature says Indonesia mangrove ecosystem consists of more than 1,000 mega ton carbon per hectare, protecting biological habitats, supplying wood raw material and cultural and educational services. The existence of mangrove ecosystem in Indonesia is very threatened due to illegal logging, mangrove conversion, and coastal reclamation. The threat of this activity caused a reduction in area of mangrove ecosystems such as various data states that until 1960 due to timber exploitation there has been degradation of mangrove ecosystem in Sumatra and Java about 200,000 hectares. The combination of timber and fish pond exploitation caused the loss of 8 100,000 hectares of mangrove in 30 years since the 90s, 80s, sorry. And also we don't, if we don't do any action or business as usual, by 2030, we will lose mangrove area almost 300,000 hectares. Based on the national mangrove map, it is stated that the conversion of mangrove to non-mangrove, which is dominated by pond, with a total area more than 600,000 hectares. As we know, the peace production tends to continue to decline. So to increase the peace production, they tend to open the new peace pond area for extensification. The target given by the president to BRGM, BRGM is uh, Peat and Mangrove uh, Restoration Agency was to rehabilitate 600,000 hect uh, hectares in mangrove out of 3.33 million hectares in nine priorities provinces. It was necessary to select location in various ways. Various ways. With the help of various parties, such as the consulting firm and individual consultant, the mangrove laws analysis was carried, was carried out to using the club lab, Hansen and lab methodologies. I'm not the GIS expert, but I think these methodologies really help us in selecting cathedral mangrove rehabilitation site. It is still necessary to improve the methodology, especially related to the provision of high-resolution satellite imagery. In addition, 
based on the lesson learned in the past year, we have finally decided to find the location that easiest to handle that we believe will give the best result. We call this location as the low hanging fruit location. And also we try to avoid location directly facing the face, the sea, because it will easy to fail due to very big waves. And also the location that have undergone rehab undergone rehabilitation and concession area such as forest and farm oil will be excluded to avoid double double claims the first three bullets are for making macro or semi uh, details plan while the last two bullets are detailed planning namely in the form of preparing the digital engineering design and implementing fpic to ensure that this plan is accordant with technical and social norm. Based on the result of macro planning using the methodologies, as I explained, the indicative location as often as shown in the image above. This indicative data should be subject to change if a more accurate methodology is used. Yes, that is why we need um, uh, some uh, help, technical assist assistance from uh, other institution. Uh, this is my this is my last slide. Based on experience in carrying out man mangrove rehabilitation activities in the last two years, we can say that there are several challenges related to. The RGM collaboration with various parties in supporting the uh, successful Im implementation of mangrove rehabilitation in Indonesia. We are very happy if there is a lot of support from various parties, especially related to technology in mangrove mapping, supporting on mangrove rehabilitation funding, development on livelihood activities, technology on M and E, including in carbon sequestration. That's all, pa Daniel, that I want to uh, present. Thank you. Thank you very much, pa Noviar. Let's give a big applause to pa Noviar from Jakarta. So please stay with us if you can. Uh, we will be hearing comments from colleagues here, and um, suddenly we take a note about uh, the importance of monitoring uh, with high resolution uh, satellite uh, uh, imageries and the need of better techniques so that uh, that's that's also an issue of quality that we are trying to bring up here in this session so um, without further ado i would like to invite pablo to comment and uh, give uh, your uh, ideas about this kind of challenge that's been put up on the table by one uh, single country, but this is an example of big mangrove landscape in, in uh, the world. I think it's quarter of the world mangrove is in Indonesia. So it's, it's good to, to jump into this uh, discussion while the issue is presented here. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me well? My name is uh, Pablo Martin. I work in the National Forest Monitoring Team. I have done some, some work with the uh, mangroves. And uh, now I'm here basically to present some of the work that my colleagues in, in the mangrove team in FAO have developed in, in different parts of the world. So I, I will be talking about high resolution satellite imagery, not only for mapping, but also for, for restoration and improving the, the confidence and um, and, and the value of the estimations of, of mangrove stents and biomass and, and etc. So I'm presenting here um, some work done by my colleagues from, from Myanmar. So they in view of a potential uh, forest reference level in, in Myanmar at a, a subnational level for the mangrove biome, um, they made a new uh, map extent of mangroves uh, taking the the frail proposed period uh, 2016 to 2021 and they used the analysis of time series of landsat 
and Sentinel uh, satellites, including temporal dynamics. And they also used some algorithms uh, present in the CPAL uh, platform that is created by, by FAO. They use some training data coming from uh, global data sets like the global uh, mangrove watch, uh, global mangrove forest distribution, and the land cover from, from Myanmar in 2015. And based in some common agreement of presence of absence of, of mangroves, they map the probability of uh, mangrove presence using a, a stratified random sampling using Google Earth Engine. Additionally, they, they trained these the data sets over uncertain areas, and this is a very nice outcome from, from this uh, assessment because they were able, through the use of visual interpretation using Collect Earth, to locate areas with new mangrove that was not estimated before. And in some provinces, they were even able to estimate as much as 50% more than was, uh, well, believed before. Uh, this also allowed, this, this system of classifications also allowed to um, create different classes, like uh, uh, the, the level of maturity of the, of the mangrove, the canopy coverage, also degraded and uh, degradation and regeneration classes in the mangrove. And they are working, still not finished, in a, in a, a basal area estimation, which uh, demonstrated to be a very good parameter related to, to, young, mature, to young and mature uh, forest mangroves. So, yeah, next slide is about the very high resolution mapping for, for mangroves. So we, we are aware of the importance of very high resolution, as Daniel said before, in satellite Im imagery to get higher details on, on mangroves. But the lack of a spatial detail uh, sometimes in, in, in the global products that I spoke before uh, results in missing uh, an inaccurate, inaccurate mapping of many of narrow and fringing uh, mangroves, for example, that are common in the small island developing states, as you can see in the in the figure there. And uh, in addition, many local managers lack the technical capacity to, to, to map these areas. So uh, we are, um, my colleagues in FAO are working in this manual to bring these capacities and these techniques and these new technologies to include in higher uh, resolution satellite imagery for, from unmanned um, aerial vehicles. <coughs> And to, to overcome uh, this problem, uh, FAO with the Nature Conservancy has developed a manual that will be released soon that provides guidance uh, and, and guarantees that the technical people can uh, be trained in, in the use of these techniques and, and are updated. So in this manual as well, uh, case studies are presented on estimating mangrove extent, extractor, uh, condition and change. And uh, they use uh, a, a range of remote sensing derived sources uh, that are focused on less than five meter spatial resolution, which is very, very high resolution. And this includes uh, historical aerial photography, uh, current resolution, optical and active satellite imagery, and also unmanned uh, aerial vehicles imagery. <coughs> So we are in the decade on, of ecosystem restoration. So it's crucial to locate the areas that have to be uh, restored and to have estimates of, of uh, degraded areas. And as Daniel said before, Indonesia has committed to rehabilitate uh, 600,000 hectares of mangrove areas. And Dalian, Daniel and his colleagues published uh, uh, last year a very interesting um, uh, article in, in Nature talking about the potential, uh, the opportunity of potential of restoration in, in Indonesia. So I, I used this map to see how we can track that some of these uh, mangrove restoration opportunity areas can be uh, monitored already with, with very high resolution imagery in terms of how they are regenerating, for example. So in this image, you can, you can see using NICFI planet, which is about 4.7 meters, uh, using monthly mosaics, 
and we can monitor the restoration of mangrove areas that occur within the restoration opportunity areas that Daniel uh, designed in this uh, or found in this article. So we can see the, the increase of the normalized vegetation index from 2017 to 2022 and, and track that the area is being like revegetated again. Uh, of course, we will have to, to go to the field to check and validate that, that this is working. This is a very uh, a special contribution where I participated last year. This was a, an assessment uh, done by the Ministry of Forest uh, of Indonesia. Uh, part of the work that we did here will be a contribution to the World Mangroves 2000-2020 uh, report that will be released this year. So in, in this project, we worked with 35 staff from the Ministry of Forestry in Indonesia in a participatory approach, and we assessed mangroves based on their experience and, and local knowledge. We conducted some dynamic trainings and, and tests and exercises to agree on the criteria on how to identify the, the mangroves. And the assessment was done using uh, collectors online based on Sentinel-2 imagery, Lancet, and very high resolution imagery such as Digital Globe or, or Mapbox. So land use change was assessed for the whole country at the national level uh, in the periods 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2010, and 2010 to 2022. We identified drivers of land use change, uh, also natural expansion, natural retraction, uh, cleared, uh, mangrove clear for settlements or gained by restoration activities. And this was a sample based uh, area estimation, which in contrast with, with maps and, and pixel counts, allows for the correction of systematic errors and provides confidence intervals. So in the lower right picture, for example, you can, you can see how this um, assessment can use for, for mangrove restoration. Uh, to, to evaluate mangrove restoration in an area where before we had the aquaculture. And this assessment helps us to, to monitor where processes of potential restoration or degradation are happening. The, the last slide I'm, I'm showing here uh, is a, from a project from Kenya. Kenya submitted his forest reference level to the UNF uh, trouble scene in 2020. And in a subsequent technical assessment, they revealed that mangroves uh, needed to be separated from, from coastal forests, as the country may be missing out uh, on reporting accurate emissions from, from this class. So through the IMPRESS project, uh, that is a, it is a project funded by the UK government, 2021 to 2023, the FAO technical team worked uh, closely with the Kenya Forest Service team and um, another uh, mangrove uh, stakeholders. And through a series of technical workshops, uh, they strengthened the, the national forest monitoring for, for Kenya. So through the wetlands work stream, a mangrove map was done for 2013 and was produced using optical remote sensing data from Landsat uh, satellite series, also using CIPAL and was publicly shared for review by the Kenyan mangrove stakeholders. The year 2013 was selected as a, as a baseline, and that will serve as the initial reference uh, year for emissions. In order to classify these, these mangrove areas, uh, the training data was semi-automatically generated from the overlap of several uh, global mangrove maps. And the map is provided at three meter spacing and has a minimum mapping unit of 0 0.45 hectares. These results are, serve as an, as an opportunity uh, for the key mangrove stakeholders in Kenya to, to build upon and further refine the mapping and emission factors, which is uh, very, very important, and particularly in change detection and, uh, and emission estimation. So my presentation finishes here. I will be very pleased to, to answer your, your questions and participate in the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pablo.
And thanks for spending time very accurately like your high resolution satellite products. Uh, our next speaker is Melissa Abdurrahim. She's speaking from Berlin in Germany, who is going to talk about how to finance you know, blue carbon project or activities uh, based on the experience the IUCN is having in the past. Melissa, time is yours. Yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, are you able to hear me okay? Yep, very good. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, so my name is uh, Melissa Abdurahim. I'm a Marine Program Officer with uh, IUCN. Um, and I'll be yeah, discussing our work on financing blue carbon projects. And before I start, I just wanted to thank uh, Daniel for the invitation and thank the other panelists for sharing the stage with me, although virtual on, on my side, uh, but very happy to be here. Um, so first to frame the conversation, um, you know, why are we talking about financing blue carbon projects and nature-based solutions and what does that mean, especially looking at uh, private sector finance? Um, there's been a lot of interest and really a need to work more with the private sector and attract more private sector finance because whether you look at it through the lens of sustainable development goals or through conservation or bio biodiversity need, the bottom line is that there's not enough government and philanthropic money to tackle the various crises that we're facing, whether the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, food security crisis, um, et cetera. So there's really a big interest in accessing and leveraging private sector finance to support conservation and restoration of ecosystems and, and nature-based solutions. We also hear this idea of a bankable project or a bankable nature-based solutions, meaning that the intervention, whether it would be restoring a patch of mangroves or restoring a coral reef, would not only pr provide benefit to people in the environment, but it would also be attractive to private sector investment. And looking at the financial landscape, which is um, the slider on the uh, bottom right corner of the slide, um, in the conservation world, in the research world, we're familiar with the right-hand side of this graph, having grants, donations to support projects, basically money that does not require a financial return on investment. It doesn't have to be paid back. But looking at the left side of the graph, we start seeing other financial mechanisms that have market returns and are profit driven. Now, the question is, how can we leverage the philanthropic and government support to mobilize private sector capital and support more conservation and restoration activities? So looking at the work that we do at IUCN, especially on coastal ecosystems, um, we manage two funding schemes focusing on blue natural capital and blue carbon. The first one, um, the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility, or BNCFF, uh, was funded by, uh, is funded by the government of Luxembourg with support from the UBS Optimus Foundation. And it was established in 2018, so it's now in its second phase. And it focuses on the development and sound uh, investable blue natural capital projects. Um, so what do we define by blue natural capital? It's the natural capital found in coastal and marine environments. Also looking at um, what ecosystem services and benefits these, um, these areas uh, provide us. The other fund um, that, we, uh, that we run is the Blue Carbon Accelerator Fund, or BCAF. Um, it was established by Australia as a dedicated funding scheme to support blue carbon restoration and conservation projects in developing countries. And while under BCAF projects do focus on blue carbon ecosystems being mangroves, seagrass, um, and salt marshes, the focus is not just on the carbon sequestration benefits, but also on all the other services that these ecosystems pr provide, including climate change adaptation and mitigation, benefit to biodiversity and livelihoods. And really the aim of these two regranting schemes is to help pave the way for private sector finance to support the restoration and conservation of these ecosystems. Um, so collectively through BNCFF and BCAF, we've supported 18 projects around the world with more to be added to this map um, soon. Under BNCFF, we run call for proposals based on particular themes. We uh, had one, for example, on green great infrastructure, which are the uh, projects on the map in bright green. Um, and we're actually um, doing one on marine protected areas for which we're selecting winners uh, as we speak. Under the BCAF, we, um, we have done calls for proposals targeting either early stage projects, which are the projects in purple, or more advanced projects, which are the one in dark green. And it's a bit difficult to see the short description for each project, but 
almost all of the pro projects have in their objectives some aspect related to blue carbon credits or using blue carbon credits as one of their revenue streams in the business model and financial strategy that they will develop with the support that they get from us. And so given the general demand and uh, for blue carbon credits and the fact that almost all of the projects that we do support include some element of you know, blue carbon credits, we wanna make sure that we support projects that um, follow the high quality blue carbon principles. Um, it, this is for one aligned with IUCN's values and standards, notably the nature-based solution standard, but it's also crucial to building trust in the quality of the projects in order to attract private sector investment, which um, many have mentioned so far. I don't know if you're familiar with this publication here on, on the left, um, but it, it calls for these five principles when um, conducting blue carbon um, projects. One, safeguarding, safeguarding nature, empowering people, employing the best information, intervention, and carbon accounting practices, operate locally and contextually, and mobilize high integrity capital. And the way we follow these principles is um, one in the review and selection process for BNCFF and BCAF. We use selection criteria such as environmental and social impact, path to financial viability and business plan, market level impacts, scalability, replicability, collaboration and active engagement with uh, government authorities and stakeholders, governance and land tenure rights, which I'm sure we'll talk more about in a minute, um, robust scientific approaches, including carbon measurements, reporting, and verification. We also assess projects against the IUCN environmental and social management system and have the projects undergo financial due diligence. And while it's important to select um, projects that receive funds following these principles, we also want to make sure that we're measuring the, the impacts of these projects. And so that's done in many ways, but two examples here are you know, measuring and quantifying key performance indicators. Um, the most common ones that we see in the projects that we support include increase in biodiversity, hectares of mangroves restored or conserved, jobs created, um, carbon sequestered, marine protected area created or coverage increase, and local communities involved. And one thing that we're starting to think about um, is how do we um, how can we standardize these blue carbon, uh, these uh, KPIs across uh, blue carbon restoration and conservation projects so that we're really able to truly compare and measure the impacts of, uh, of projects. Um, one way that we can measure impact is also by compiling ocean accounts um, that include com comparable data on ocean environmental assets. So for example, the extent or condition of a mangrove, um, ecosystem uh, economic activities such as the sale of fisheries product and social condition such as employment. Um, and we're actually doing this kind of uh, as, a, as a pilot um, through the, the projects that we fund under BCAF um, and the, the more advanced projects. And we're doing this in partnership with the Global Account Partnership. So the project developers will be able to have access to, to experts and, and help them gather the necessary data, including remote sensing data to compile the ocean accounts and produce credible information um, that you know, would um, support the uptake and development of crediting methods, including carbon credits, and also inform potential funders and investors and uh, really increase uh, private sector investment in their projects, or at least that's the goal. Um, and to conclude, I just wanted to highlight some of the successes that we've had in the past through BNCFF. As I mentioned, it's in second phase. So we have uh, a bit of uh, reflection and lessons learned and successes from the project. So just citing um, three projects here, uh, Blue U, which is a project in Indonesia combining uh, mango restoration and sustainable shrimp aquaculture was able to secure additional grant funds from the global EBA fund after they received support from BNCFF. Coast for Sea, which works on sustainable seaweed aquaculture, was able to secure an impact investor. And the Turnif Adult Sustainability Association in, Be in Belize was able to secure a loan from the Sustainable Ocean Fund, um, thanks to the support that they received from BNCFF. And I wanted to highlight this example from Belize, and notably the business plan that they developed um, to finance the MPA that they manage. Their revenue model includes in income from sustainable tourism, marine protected area, visitor fee, support from public agency, grants, 
loans, and also the future sale of carbon credits. So this is a great example of an organization that was previously fully reliant on grant funds or public funds and was able to develop a blended finance model to include carbon credits as one of the revenue streams and became interesting to investors and then was able to secure a loan. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about the projects that we've supported in the past and especially the business model that they've developed, um, I invite you to go to our website. Um, I'll put it out on my last slide and check out the blueprint series, which were developed by each of the projects that we've supported. And we'll have much more to add as the, uh, the current, currently supported projects wrap up in the coming years. Um, and with that, I leave you with my email and the uh, our website. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Melissa. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Certainly, the issue of quality is not only on the carbon quality itself, but many aspects related to financing. So, um, and also biodiversity. Uh, Tim, you want to pick this up immediately, and uh, it's a challenge. Please. Right, hello everybody. Um, so the question is, how do we get private sector funding coming into restoring things like mangroves? Well, firstly, let's get rid of the problem that, it's, that there's no money out there. In fact, you've got the exact opposite problem. You've got a huge amount of private sector funding looking for high quality restoration projects. It's a not a demand side problem, it's a supply side problem. There just aren't enough of these projects that are available in order to uh, um, satisfy the marketplace. And to give you an idea of the scale of it, I mean, in, in, according to Refinitiv, in, in 2021, the private sector uh, spent $900 billion on carbon. Now, most of that was, most of that was uh, compliance market, uh, and a tiny bit was, was uh, um, the voluntary market. But virtually none of that tiny, tiny element of it was actually mangrove restoration. So why? Why is everything blocked? Why isn't it coming through? Well, let's look at some of the, the major factors you've got to consider when you are trying to get a high quality carbon uh, credit project. The first one is additionality, of course. So if you, I don't know why it's doing that, if you uh, clear an area of mangroves and expose the sediment like that, on average, you'll lose about eight tonnes of carbon per hectare per year. Now, so the IPCC uh, figures quoted in, in, in the carbon stock changes. Um, if you do that over 25 years, which is the length of one of these private sector projects, that's 200 tonnes of carbon. Now, remember, you're probably not going to get more than about 300 tonnes of carbon for above ground, below ground, uh, and additional sedimentation over that time period. So that takes you up into a high carbon intensive uh, type of habitat, which allows you to bring down the price of carbon, which makes it very attractive then to start getting investment in those sorts of projects. And incidentally, um, I was hearing about the, the shrimp farming in, in, in Indonesia, and, and we see that all around the world. But on average, when we check out these sites, 40% of the area that's destroyed, like the one you just see here, and this one is actually in Honduras, is, is not being used for uh, shrimp farms or the shrimp farm has gone bust because they've been uh, very unsuccessful in actually producing the, the shrimps or the fish from them. So the first thing to do is make sure the proper accounting is done for carbon you would lose unless you took action, restored the hydrology, replanted that area. And the second thing we should, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room knows this, but you'd still be surprised that some projects start out without fixing the hydrology. How do you do a mangrove restoration without firstly restoring the hydrology and checking the sediment is correct before you can actually put your proper gills or, or plant your seeds in there? And this is a project in Honduras where we have literally hundreds of people from local communities digging channels. Uh, and in fact, if you go onto Google Earth and look up the Bay of Fonseca, you can actually see now on Google Earth the effects that these guys have had in restoring the mangrove, uh, in restoring the hydrology by hand. But a second way of bringing the, making this competitive is to quantify biodiversity as well as the carbon uplift. And that's a real problem, quantifying biodiversity, because it's not as simple as carbon. There's no equivalent to the carbon dioxide molecule. 
However, if you think about the consumer price index, which is a basket of goods and services that every country measures, uh, prices up at time one, does it a year later, that gives them their, their annual inflation rate. And we compare inflation rates around the world. But every country has a completely different basket of goods and services. It doesn't matter because that's what they're buying, so therefore that's what you're trying to quantify. Well, why not use the same approach for biodiversity? Why not have a basket of metrics that reflect the conservation objectives of what you're trying to achieve on your site? So if you're trying to restore a coral reef, for example, you might be looking at things like rugosity and coral cover and, and the um, species richness and um, abundance of herbivorous fish or piscivorous fish and the same for, for um, uh, macroinvertebrates that have been commercially exploited. But if you're going to do a farm in Lowell, England and turn it, make it rewilding, not one of those metrics applies because there you're looking at soil biodiversity, higher plants, total arthropods, reading birds, etc. So what you're doing is you're fixing the metrics to reflect what you would see as a significant uplift if you came back and said, okay, well, that mangrove looks a lot better than it did a few years ago, or that reef is better for biodiversity. What's the basis you're making that decision on? Those are the metrics you choose. And by metric, I mean taxa. So you take an entire taxa, might be soil invertebrates or you know, a functional one like that, or it might be a zoological one like butterflies, and you measure them at time one, and you're going to measure them at time two using exactly the same methods, effort and survey techniques. Now, when you do that, you start off with a species list, but not all species are the same value. Some are much more important than others on the basis of their rarity. So you grade each species on a five point scale, five being the rarest, one being the least rare, and you use the local red list schemes for that. But when you come to remeasure, you're not just looking for change in species richness. What you're looking for is an increase in populations. That 70% of biodiversity that everyone talks about that we've lost isn't species, it's populations that have declined. So you're looking for an increase in abundance. So every species, you, you assess its abundance on a five point scale. So the most abundant are a five, the least abundant are a one. You multiply the abundance by the importance values for say breeding birds, sum them up, that gives you a figure at time one. You do it again, two or three years later, that will give you another figure, hopefully a higher figure, not just because of extra species, but because of population growth. But every one of those metrics will have also changed by uh, a different percentage figure. So you take the median value of that and multiply it by the number of hectares, which gives you the number of biodiversity credits. Now that system is up and running. Um, you can now get it validated and verified through Plan Vivo, or you will be able to from uh, the middle of this year. Uh, Vera is developing a, a methodology that's very similar. It's also on a percentage change in the value of biodiversity per hectare. So we're gradually getting sort of congruence on, on, the, on the approach that should be used for quantifying biodiversity. So why not use it when you're doing something like mangrove restoration? I know it's not massive. I mean, if, if you're doing an, a native forest on land, then probably 50% of your money had come from biodiversity and 50% comes from carbon. Here, it's going to be more 90% carbon than you know, 10 to 15% uh, biodiversity. But it helps, it helps bring down the potential cost of the, bio, of the carbon because you can also quantify the biodiversity. Now, we need investors to make a profit. And that's what we're all skirting around. Someone's putting money in, they want that money back with a profit. But can that be done fairly? And that's the important issue. So the projects that we run at Replanet, we require that 60% of the issuance price of the credits is paid to the local stakeholders. That's the owners, users, managers of those sites. But we're trying to get carbon credits, high quality carbon credits for say $10. If they're put onto the market today, they're probably worth three times that. You could resell them for $30. And that means the local communities have been cheated. They've only got 20% of the income. So we put, a requirement on any resale of credits that 60% of any profits over and above the issuance price, or by the time the company retires them, let's say they're buying them and retiring in a future years against the market price, 60% is paid directly back to the communities. That creates huge sums of money. So when we're restoring a mangrove, if you're 
say, like take the Honduras example, doing two of 2,200 hectares there, the local communities on the base, on the base uh, budgets are getting $13 million. By the time you add the increase in price over time, it's probably going to be closer to $40 million. And that's for, that's for restoring 2,200 hectares of mangroves. You just think of the numbers of the investment that could come in into Indonesia, given the amount of areas that they have available to them. It's an absolutely enormous potential international investment. There's an organization called the Business Association for Scaling Climate Solutions. It's got little company in it, companies in it like Meta and Microsoft and Google and uh, Coca-Cola and Salesforce. So huge funds behind them. They want to restore half the world's um, damaged mangroves. The money's there. It can be done and it can be done at the sorts of rates of pay that I'm talking about because even allowing for the fact that the investor only gets 40% of the uplift instead of 100% of the uplift, they can still make a profit. So all the projects we're running, we ask for something like a three to four million investment, and then that's repaid in five to nine years, and the investor gets a 15 to 18% IRR over the first 13 years of the project. That's a commercial rate of investment, a commercial rate of return. So what you should be looking at is this is a fantastic opportunity, not just to restore mangroves, but to help some of the most impoverished people in the world, because these are significant cash flows that can come that way. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you, then. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, Tui, you want to pick up on the challenge of ownership that uh, Tim underlining there, because where the benefits should be shared, who are uh, you know, have the right to get that. Um, thank you very much, Daniel. And also thanks a lot for our great uh, presentation earlier. Um, so I think that like we just have heard four presentations, uh, particularly from Tim and Melissa on the financial opportunities uh, to change behavior um, of local people on the ground, as well as providing financial incentive for people to protect mangrove through uh, blue carbon. But as Daniel said, the key question is how are you going to unfold all of this activity on the ground? When you have to dealing with government agency as well as multi-stakeholder on the ground, who have to really operationalize both international as well as national and also private sector requirement on how to do it. So, with where our work at C4, as Daniel said, we was very lucky to receive the funding from Norwegian government through the Global Comparative Study on Red Plus, as well as USAID through SRAM, SRAM program, looking at different governance um, structure, particularly on blue carbon, and the outcome in terms of social and economic impact um, on this arrangement. So my presentation today was really to share a little bit on the reality check on whether or not what are proposing by the private sector as well as different international initiatives could be easily carried out in developing countries with a very complex situation. And through both of our global comparative study on Red Plus as well as SWAM project, it is very clear to us that for many government agencies as well as indigenous people on the ground, it is very unclear for them on how to implement blue carbon project. And it is not just only about technical um, capacity or, or the techni technical requirement, but more importantly is our uh, the key governance questions. For example, who should pay, who should be paid, who benefit from this mechanism, what to pay, how to pay, and particularly from the MRV perspective, not just only the carbon benefit, but the non-carbon benefit on social outcome and also social inclusion, particularly giving a special focus on um, local communities and indigenous people. It is a key concern for many government agencies and indigenous people and local communities. So in terms of the reality check, uh, team often come and, and, and say to us that, you know, we really need to support the government, particularly in many developing countries to accelerate the process to receive the blue carbon payment. On the other hand, at the country's level, there was a huge concern raised by different government agencies and local communities 
that the process is too fast. The, the process is too fast because you are trying to do things when the legal framework are not ready in place, when it is unclear how the local communities would really benefit from it, and what is the source of safeguard mechanism could pretending any negative impact on the ground. And so why there is an urgent need and demand to accelerate blue carbon, it cannot be rushed until some of the key underlying concern of both government agencies and indigenous people are not resolved. And in here, the key questions of who benefit and legitimacy in decision making process is key. I think that with our global comparative study on REP+, Plus, we documented since 1997 until now, globally there are about 700 uh, REP+ Plus project or forest carbon project globally. Only 5% of that project focus on mangrove which is giving a little bit of new opportunities at the set, but also it explaining the reason why it has not advanced in blue carbon. Because from the government perspective, only 22% of that carbon project referring directly the benefit has to go to local communities. A very small amount, a percentage of this project even put a clear requirement of free prior informed and consent at a, pre, a key principle for this blue carbon project. So I'm extremely happy to see Indonesia when they put you know, the site selection and the key determination of the blue carbon project is really on free prior informed and consent. The other thing is when, when they mentioned about 60% of the revenue should be dedicated to the local communities, it is a brilliant idea and it's a very nice idea. But it's not easy to implement it on the ground because who actually going to have access to the 60%? Who actually in the communities we are talking about because the community themselves are not homogenous and our global comparative studies show that there is a lot of elite capture and also inhomogeneous um, among the community. So actually the targets of the group who are the poor actually not really benefit from that 60 percent so there is a whole new mechanism in terms of how you're going to structure that payment so that that 60 percent going to the most vulnerable group and coming in in the name of equity there is also a legitimacy in decision making process and i wanted to bring a case study with swam project that usaid funded in vietnam where we comparing the effectiveness of mangrove particularly on blue carbon in vietnam since 1990 until 2022 under four different governance regime one is led by government agency one is led by private sector one is led by local communities and the other one is led by donor and we're comparing in terms of the social outcome. And what struck us the most is that all of this project that we are studying, there is a lack of involvement from the local community perspective. And the only project that stand out that are still ongoing right now is the one that is led by the communities. So in here, while we're talking a lot about private sector and also um, the donor driven initiative, I would try, you know, we really need to also take into account the community led initiative as well as the government led program. And in here, we have the government of Vietnam have shown quite a successful case study on the national scheme on payment for environmental services. The other thing that I wanted to reflect on earlier comment from Bach Daniel on the high integrity. So I guess that with the Paolo presentation, we hear about climate integrities on how we can actually measure the carbon outcome. And again, with team, we hear about biodiversity, which is also a very key component of you know, high quality blue carbon credit. But in here, we also highlight the social integrity, where you look a strong focus on social um, um, dimensions of the blue carbon. And on the one hand, there is a lot of negative in saying that blue carbon might be a way to lead to transformational change in the way how we're going to cover mangrove. But we should also underline the fact that we also need transformational change to enable blue carbon, particularly if you don't resolving the issue of land tenure, social safeguard, you know, the rise and the participation of the local communities. It's going nowhere in terms of social integrity, and it is a key message that we want to highlight. What we also was able to document it with our global project through both GCR Plus and also through SWAM is that. Most of the blue carbon project right now is really give a strong emphasis on project. And I think that it has a huge challenges for the government agency, particularly in developing countries, because in this country, you need to link to a broader transformational chain in the legal framework and also how you're going to cover um, the mangrove. 
And also the fact is that you're addressing a certain specific project without looking at the, addressing the key drivers of mangrove loss, which is sometimes really associated to the national development agenda or political economy that are outside of the project side, would not really helpful in addressing the mangrove loss. So this is also another key message. Another key message that we wanted to highlight through our SWAM project is that most of the blue carbon project right now, and we, we understand about the additionalities of the project, but the fact that most of the carbon project focus on reforestation and afforestation, giving a very wrong signal to the government agency on not protecting standing mangrove. And this is the key challenges right now that, you know, when we're looking at the local communities level, they're questioning, you know, why, why not standing forest? So I think that the last point that I wanted to highlight is the role of science in this and why we have acquired a lot of advancement in terms of technologies and data on blue carbon measurement. We have very limited scientific evidence on the impact of blue carbon project on the social outcome. And there is a key research gap that we want to highlight in order to moving our science um, advancement, but also political discussion to moving blue carbon ahead. Because the key question that we were always being asked by the government agencies on every day, it show us not just only the environmental outcome of blue carbon, but also the social impact. Yeah, so that is a key message that we want to highlight with our C4 work. Thank you. Thank you, Tui. Very inspiring and certainly will lead to hot discussion uh, from the floor as well as from the participant online. Um, is there any participant online uh, asking questions? Uh, yes, yes, we can is. give the first opportunity for colleagues who are in the room, is, if there is any. Evan? Yes, it's coming. Thank you, Evan Notman with uh, USAID. First of all, thank you for uh, a really excellent set of uh, presentations. I really like uh, the range uh, covered from some of the technical issues to uh, getting down into the uh, private sector and then some of the, the governance and community issues. Really, really excellent. Um, I'd like to maybe ask a question that's uh, a little bit outside of, of what you've talked about, but, but uh, really reflects where you are uh, at GFOI, and, and of course, GFOI is the Global Forest Observation Initiative. Um, but as a as an initiative, we recognized the increasing uh, need and importance to start uh, understanding uh, the gray area between uh, forests and mangroves, um, peatlands, and and you know into the into the blue carbon. Um, I think. In, in your name, blue carbon, you're, 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 you're kind of talking about it as treating it separately on the blue side, not necessarily on the forest side. Um, but I think part of what we what we also want to explore is understanding, you know, where is that line and how do how do we how do we draw it? Uh, you know, I think particularly with mangroves, we've seen that there are these complex issues between what we call a, what what is determined a forest nationally uh what is how those are, you know um rules around tenure in mangroves versus forests may be different certainly uses are different so there are these range of challenges between kind of when something is treated as a forest or blue carbon and, and i wonder if it, if any of the panelists would like to comment a little bit on on thinking about uh how to address kind of working on uh, both the carbon finance, but this broader finance kind of as, as, as blue carbon versus kind of a subset of, of a forest carbon and, and where they've seen that happening or not. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize it's a little bit outside of, of what you talked about, but I think very relevant to the, to the audience. To the, uh, OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Evan. Uh, Pablo, are you challenged to response on that? You are close enough to GFY. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say, in, in my opinion, there would be like two, two perspectives. One is on the, um, on the field of carbon, so but we, we can analyze ecosystems by the quantity of carbon that they store. So, so it's like peatlands, mangroves, the 
well, recently, so researchers know that for, for years, but the huge amount of carbon that is stored and the importance of these ecosystems for, for climate change and, and emissions. And then I think there is another related with the ecosystems themselves. So all of them are important. We, we are working in the, in the decade of, of ecosystem restoration. And uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, mangroves are, they, they have a huge biodiversity that has to be preserved. It was super interesting what he said that, that part of this um, remuneration should go to, to biodiversity, not only like uh, working on carbon because, and, and I recently read an article um, from our colleagues in, in Restore that said that productivity of the forest is enhanced by the biodiversity, only if there is like a threshold of biodiversity in, in that forest. So I think that everything is, is related, but I agree with you, it's, it's hard to, um, yeah, to, to, to draw this line dividing between forests, mangroves, peatlands, it's, a, it's complex. Rich and then uh, Aki. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for an excellent session and, and excellent uh, presentations. Um, I, uh, uh, Twee, you made a really good point and it's something that I've been trying to figure out. Um, so first of all, if you, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rich McKenzie, I'm with the Forest Service. Uh, I'm based in the, in the Pacific, I work on small Pacific islands. And uh, we've been thinking a lot about uh, mangrove conservation in those islands and trying to generate potential funding uh, for conservation. And the issue there is not restoration because they're just, they're not, we don't have the problems with aquaculture, uh, it's development. Uh, so hotels, uh, malls, homes. And so it's, it's not additionality, it's um, uh, uh, prevention. Um, uh, so, and, and, and when I've done the numbers, so we actually have productivity estimates for mangroves in some of these Pacific islands. And if, even if we use the upper, you know, if we can get $25 a ton of carbon per hectare, and that's a big if, uh, the money is just isn't there um, to convince people not to uh, build a hotel because they can make more money uh, from that hotel. And so, uh, sorry, this is a long question that I'm getting at. But um, the, so the conversations we've had are then, okay, so looking at, uh, so Tim, you, you mentioned looking at biodiversity and getting funding for that. And so that's one of the issues on the, t the table is okay, so how do we look at other services that the mangroves provide and, and then generate funding uh, to support this idea of con conserving mangroves? And I'm curious, um, so I'm, this is, I'm getting to my question now. So with carbon, we have a method, right? We've got the SWAT method, so we can go out there and we can quantify carbon stocks. Is there a method to quantify biodiversity, like a published method that we can go and use? And then how do we pursue funds for those levels of biodiversity? Thank you, Rich. Um, Tui, you want to respond on the benefits and then the team will be on the biodiversity accounting. Yeah, so Rich, just thanks a lot for the reflection. So actually, like when Melissa presented different financial model, I do think that in the cases like in Vietnam, in some areas and the case study that you said, the blended financing mechanisms is needed. Because apparently, if you're looking right now, and we have the government of Vietnam representative here that he can command, but I think that like if in the restoration area, most likely that team said they would have attractive, quite a strong financial incentive from the private sector. But when you're referring to the standing forest, I see the huge potential roles of national scheme like the one in Vietnam on payment for forest environmental services are looking strictly speaking from different uh, national state budgets allocation because they have a very limited budget they have to prioritize where the money from the state or through that national program paying for different type of environmental services would go to and at the moment if you're looking at it spreading the CAC it seen it didn't generate any additionalities or any environmental impact at the case of payment for environmental services in Vietnam. So prioritizing this kind of uh, finance mechanism and focusing on protecting the natural forest could be quite an um, attractive solution and giving the government agency as well as the funding would be used in an effective and efficient manner. I just hand over it to the team then. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Before I answer the biodiversity question, can, can, I, can I just really clarify the difference between avoided loss and reforestation? Because there's a massive difference in prices. So if you are doing an avoided forest loss project, if you're talking about in the, in the Pacific, your best bet is going to be around about eight to nine dollars. And that was before the Guardian article. And those of you who didn't see the Guardian article, then you must be very few people out there who haven't seen it. But what they were arguing was that most of these avoided forest loss credits are worthless. And the argument they, they used for that, incidentally, was completely fallacious, is that if you have a, a forest and you're going to protect it because it's going to, there's a deforestation rate of, say, 2%, then you can protect half of that forest over 25 years because you'd have lost half of it and so you monetize that half and the other half is your leakage zone so you're trying to protect that entire forest what they argued was once you've started on that project and you're paying communities to look after it and all that sort of thing if the forests around it also opt for red plus schemes or sovereign credits come in and the entire country adopts a zero deforestation rate their argument is well, the people that invested first, they've got lost all their credits. That first project is now worthless because the background rate of deforestation is zero. That seems to me to be a completely nonsensical argument because it would wipe out the use of avoided deforestation. What they should be saying is you, de you determine the point of deforestation at the rate, at, sorry, at the point at which you agree to fund the forest for 25 years. So if it's at 2% of that point, then you keep it at that point for that 25 years. That would allow that mechanism to still continue until we do get to, to zero deforestation. But the reason I'm banging on about that is because it's made a big difference in prices. Prices are crashing. So um, in terms of uh, avoided deforestation, I mean, you're, you're finding credits on the market now at 2 and $3. So getting anywhere near $25 in places like Fiji, for example, would be completely impossible for avoided deforestation. So flip to the, to the question you asked me, though, which was about biodiversity credits. Um, yes, the methodology that I just described is, is open source. It's published. It's free to use for anyone to use that. We've got something like 5 million credits already pledged. We've got 25 projects developed around the world and a lot of other organizations using this, uh, this technique because you can will be able to get it independently validated and verified by Plan Vivo from the middle of this year. That's the only independent validation and verification system that exists, and it uses exactly this methodology I'm talking about. Uh, and you're also finding that, that Vera is moving very close to the same type of methodology that, that, I, that I just described. But in the end, you don't even need certification bodies, because what are you going to do when you get a pile of data coming in? I mean, this time, it's not like carbon. You're not looking to see if the trees are on the ground. You're, you want to know, have the fish populations increased? Have, have, have the epiphytes increased, etc. And so what you're going to be doing is collecting lots of data digitally as much as possible. So whoever's going to audit that is going to get gigabytes of acoustic data and camera trap data and meta barcoding data. Now, your average carbon certification body can't handle that. So they're going to have to use academics. So there's a, there's a group of academics have now been funded by NERC and SERC in the UK to look at the science behind the biodiversity credit. And they've got over a million uh, pounds to do that. And they're using some of that to set up an international body of scientists, so leading experts in different taxa, different ecoregions that can be used for peer review. So when you have a claim for biodiversity uplift of say 50%, you send your data to this organization and they will do an independent peer review of it they won't give you a certificate but they will say yes you've got a 50 percent increase or no you haven't you've only got a 40 percent increase in biodiversity but it provides an independent peer review mechanism once you've got that in position that opens up all sorts of opportunities for blockchain for other organizations to step in and do the other parts of, of the certification process so the, the answer is yes to your question very quickly. There is, it's published. If you, uh, I've got a load of cards with me. Anyone who wants one, I'm happy to give you at the end of this. If you email me, I'll send you the link to it. Uh, but there are organizations all around the world beginning to use that, that methodology. Thank you, Tim. Um, after Aki, we will have questions from the audience uh, online, please. Yeah, thank you. Okiro Sinkvist from uh, Global Mario Watch. 
Um, I wonder if there are any uh, guidance out there on restoration, uh, because um, it's uh, within the Global Mangrove Watch, and we are collaborating also with the Global Mangrove Alliance. Uh, restoration is a big thing, of course, um, but there is um, um, uh, a bit of a fear that there will be kind of say. Um, uh, unregulated or, or uh, a lot of replanting of mangroves uh, in areas where which are perhaps not um, uh, best for for replanting. I mean, replanting uh, of mangroves is quite often not actually the most efficient way to restore mangroves. Uh, Tim alluded to it uh, in, in his presentation, and I know that Daniel has said so too. I mean, you need to restore the hydrology. You need to store, restore the, the, uh, uh, the soil so that uh, the mangroves can regenerate themselves. I mean, you can help a little bit with, with, to, to, for, for the mangrove to get started, but these kind of massive uh, um, replanting projects are not always the most uh, efficient ones. Uh, and also, uh, one fear is that um, um, uh, people will mistake mud banks for wasteland. Mud banks have a very important uh, uh, um, function, of course, for, for bird population, etc. Uh, and they are, uh, in, in many cases, not really suitable for mangrove restoration. So basically, coming to my question, uh, is is there any, uh, say, uh, um, guidance on how restoration should be performed in the most efficient way? Uh, because also, if you have uh, investors, uh, they would also, of course, like to ensure that uh, the the restoration project is successful uh, even after ten years, uh, etc. Pablo, you want to comment? Yes, I think I can take that one. So, because I, I also work with the task force on monitoring here in FAO, so I, I work in that. And this morning we had the, a session about ecosystem restoration. So we, we have developed uh, developed this framework for ecosystem restoration and the, and the platform where we expect that we will be able to collect uh, for now uh, national areas of uh, all ecosystems uh, being restored and we, we, we are building a registry for that. Uh, we, we have been uh, nominated or, or charged with uh, leading the target two development of the global uh, biodiversity framework that is an indicator to uh, estimate areas under restoration in the world. And within the firm, going to your question, uh, there, we also have the task of best practices. So we are compiling a database of best practices in uh, all types of ecosystems around the world. Uh, so this will be freely available and freely accessible. And the, the aim is that is to, to collect all this information that has worked somewhere and can, can work in elsewhere with similar conditions. So that's the, that's the idea. And going to the, to the example on, on the work where I participated in, in Indonesia, we, we spread these 3,000 plots over Indonesia. We have data for 30 years uh, of the change of this uh, 30 years, what, what has been degraded, what has been restored. So we, have a, we are accumulating a bunch of data to, to, have, uh, to understand better when restoration is, is, uh, is, is being produced, what are the indicators, and uh, of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult in the science of restoration to, to know when the restoration is, is complete. We, we don't know. Uh, it's very hard to, to assess if the restoration, you can see, yes, this is restored. But uh, during this decade, we are really devoting to, to restoration. So yeah, we, we will have a lot of information about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my concern is just that I, I think that this kind of guidance needs to go out actually before the project starts yeah. because uh, you know i mean uh, w despite all the good intention it could actually have the opposite effect on certain ecosystems yeah. uh, so i think that that's a very maybe it's something that we can broadly bring up to the edge of why on the methods and guidance uh, as well you know, some some guidance on on the restoration of different ecosystems
Yeah, I mean, within the Global Mango Watch, uh, on that website, we actually also have uh, um, uh, restoration potential maps uh, that kind of indicates at a rather coarse scale, uh, but uh, which areas that are more suitable for restoration in terms of hydrology, et cetera, uh, than, than others. So I think that there is a lot of information uh, that could be used uh, to, to guide a lot of restoration projects, but uh, I think, yeah, Basically, my, 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 my basic point is that there, there should be a, a little bit of caution and then not just kind of rush to, to replant, right? So. You want yeah, to okay. be, be brief, team, because brief. we only have two minutes left. Very briefly, I want to do a shout out for Jorge Herrera in Mexico, who's done a lot of this advisory work for Central and, and South America. The second point I wanted to make is one of the advantages of private sector funding is, is, it, is it's results led. So if you end up planting a load of propagules on, on an area that they're not going to grow, you're going to lose money by doing that. And that means the investors want to get the, the best people in, in the country to help with designing that mangrove restoration. Thank you. We have one or two uh, questions online. Uh, Vani will read it. Yeah, okay. Questions from Denis Sonwa to Dr. Novier. Many thanks for this presentation. Following the bond restoration challenge, many countries develop a national st uh, restoration strategy. I wanted to know if Indonesia has a national restoration strategy. Did that national restoration strategy include mangrove area? Did Indonesia develop a specific restoration strategy for mangrove ecosystem? What were the steps in developing this specific restoration mangrove strategy? Panofiar, are you with us? Please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dennis Sonwa, Pit and Mangrove Restoration Agency and Ministry of Environment and Forestry have prepared a roadmap for mangrove rehabilitation. In this roadmap, a mangrove rehabilitation strategies has been established. There are five strategies, such as one, mangrove rehabilitation as a part of effort to increase welfare and the community. The second is mangrove management as a part of climate change mitigation. The third, collaboration with, with various stakeholders in mangrove ecosystem to ensure the sustainability. The fourth, encouraging the strengthening of the legal protection on mangrove management. And the last one is using various finance source. Uh, Daniel, I want to comment also to uh, the person from Global Mangrove Watch. In, in, Indonesia, in Indonesia, we also develop a terminology of rehabilitation, including 3M. In Indonesia, Indonesian, we call memulihkan as a restore, meningkatkan as a improve, and the mempertahankan is protection. We are believe that uh, if we just mm, have uh, if we are believe if we are only make a re, uh, replanting without care about the mangrove intake mangrove we will have a problem because the uh, the availability funding or rehabilitation in terms of replanting for indonesia is very difficult this is very hard to, to do that. That is why we are believe we need also to restore the intact uh, mangrove. That's why we, we develop 3M, including uh, protection of intact mangrove. That's why. Thank you. Thank you very much, Panofiar. So thank you for all the questions that has been raised uh, in this session. Uh, that's definitely enriched our understanding. So before I conclude, I just want to wrap up with uh, uh, intrigued by questions from Aki about um, map of restoration priority. Um, Pablo mentioned about this uh, paper that we published uh, early this year uh, with my students. And um, suddenly for Indonesia case that Noviar described, um, we don't go beyond 200,000. We are identifying the loss in the last 20 years of about 200,000. And uh, the cause of that loss is uh, various. 
And then the, in terms of rehabilitation, we try to use a number of proxies to help how to you know, fine tune where this uh, restoration should be done. Uh, we have the map, but this is a summary of what would be the driver of uh, deforestation and degradation. And we look at that uh, at the end of that exercise, we, we have the majority uh, with high, um, sorry, the minority is high scenario, meaning that there are uh, very low, um, uh, very high opportunity, but very uh, minimum size of, of degraded mangrove. So you can do uh, of or, or concentrate or focus on this uh, relatively uh, low or short, uh, small area, but with high probability of success, because uh, one of the main issues, as Tui indicated, the tenurial system is much clearer in this place compared with those areas which are very low in terms of success because the, the uh, land title ownership is not very clear. And that's the majority of that uh, 200,000 is about 90,000 of uh, mangrove degraded land. So with that kind of exercise, uh, Pablo coming in and trying to look at into finer resolution where they are. And um, again, the issue of social aspect, including ownership will, will be a factor in to help restoration of mangrove uh, carry, uh, carried out by the Indonesian government currently. So uh, we've been talking uh, a lot about quality, but suddenly quality of project has multiple uh, facets here. It's not only the quality of the carbon itself, but also the way the project is designed and how they incorporate many aspects, including social and uh, success is also measured by the impact in the social uh, area, uh, especially the uh, better behavior of people and, and well-being. That's, that's really uh, the challenge. Uh, even if the mangrove is back on the ground, but people are still poor and behaving like before, that's not a good uh, uh, indicators of success. And certainly ownership is very crucial to be identified to, to have this high success of high quality project. Secondly, um, we need the help of remotely sensed uh, data, but with finer resolution to, to improve our understanding where this uh, restoration area should be located uh, to help reducing the costs in, in, in um, identifying this area. That's very crucial. And lastly, I think we, we've been learning a lot about the issue of governance. Um, TUI's experience uh, with the GCS RED is very clear there that uh, governing a project is not just for the sake of project implementation, but certainly the sustainability of that uh, project after the activities and under the name of project is over. So if it is like a, a one day event, then uh, if the project is over, everybody will disappear. That's, that's not a good thing. So with that, I would like to conclude our session. Thank you very much for your contribution, conversation in this room and also colleagues uh, online. Thank you. <laughs>